Good morning. Okay, it's, technically it's good afternoon, because it's kind of 10 past 12. So, uh, good afternoon. There's a British thing that happens, that when the first time you see someone in a day, you say good morning. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. And, you know, say good morning. It's kind of like a greeting protocol. Good morning, good morning. How are you? I'm fine. You never, ever say how you are. Okay, that's breaching protocol. The problem happens around about noon, because you know just after noon that it's not morning anymore, so now you're kind of lying. So you can actually, you can use this to spot British spies, okay? So what you do is you say, like, what you, you stand near them, within, eye, within line of sight, but not within speaking distance, really close to midday, and if they're British, their palms will start to sweat, because they're like, he's going to engage me in a minute, and I'm going to need to say good, the word, oh no, like that. So why on earth am I talking about this nonsense? Because, because, it's, because it's, a, it's an idiom. It's a, it's a model we use. It's a way we uh, identify ourselves, our Britishness, us British folks. You know, we have these funny little quirks. Americans have their funny little quirks as well. Okay, we're going to be looking at some of those sorts. Of, I just want you to bear in mind these sorts of things. This talk is called Kicking the Complexity Habit. Okay, so kicking the complexity habit, there's a kind of, it's a... You can see there's like a metaphor at work there. There's like a, the idea that it's an addiction. It's a habit, which is euphemism. And, and you look at the title, Kicking the Complexity Habit. There's four words there. And I'm thinking, they probably don't need to be four words there. Kicking complexity. Says nothing less, does it? Right? Still kicking of a thing. So it has the kind of, it's a habit, and we're trying to break the habit. It also has a nice second meaning, which is like we're kicking complexity. So I quite like that. Even that's a bit busy. Complexity. Okay. Why, why, why am I talking about this, the title of this slide? Because complexity is everywhere. Unnecessary complexity is everywhere. Even in something as innocuous as the title of a talk called Kicking the Complexity Habit, or as something as surely harmless as greeting someone. Okay, there's complexity in all these things. Where I want to try to get you guys today, the thing I'm going to try and do and almost certainly fail spectacularly, is to help you develop a sensibility around complexity. I want to make you aware of complexity. Okay, uh, how many, I imagine most of you, how many have seen the, the video with the basketball players and the bear kind of wanders through and break dances his way through? Okay, if you haven't seen this, uh, Google for breakdance, have a look on YouTube for breakdancing bear, it's incredible. There's literally a bear breakdances backwards through a bunch of people playing basketball and you don't notice the first time you watch it. And the second time you watch it, anyway, I won't tell you the, the second spoiler. Um, the point about this is once you're aware of it, you can't not see it. And I want to kind of tear away the veil a bit, that's what I'm going to try and do. Okay. So I, I've been, uh, I watched a video not so long ago by a guy called Brett Victor called Inventing on Principle. Uh, um, usually I reference books, so they don't seem to be referencing videos. Go and watch Inventing on Principle. Uh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful, wonderful talk about the idea that there are certain people kind of a bit evangelical, kind of a bit hand-wavy, kind of a bit loud and outspoken, who want to change the world in some very narrow way. Okay? So Brett Victor's principle is you should get immediate feedback from the thing you're creating. It helps the creative process. So I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, do I have a principle? Do I have any principles? Yeah, as uh, uh, Groucho Marx says, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. Right. Um, what would my guiding principle be for this? And, and I ran this, I did the wife test. I ran this by my wife, and I said, is this the kind of thing I say? And she said, Dan, you say this all the time. It really shouldn't be this difficult. And I'll look at code, I'll look at design, I'll look at organizations, I'll look at teams, I'll look at people, I'll look at systems. It really, oh God, it really shouldn't be this difficult. So what am I going to try and talk about over the next bunch of time? Um, I want you to know your enemy. Okay, so there's, there's kind of three, three parts to this talk for some value of three. The first thing is I want to help us learn to identify complexity. Complexity is everywhere, and it is so subtle and so insidious, you don't notice it. Okay? 
once I mention that the room that you're in is full of little gold chairs with little gold chair backs, uh, you can't not see them now. Yeah? You were completely ignoring them. You'd already deleted them. The people at the front here, the room isn't full of little gold chairs with little gold chair backs. Okay? But everyone else. Okay? Um, so mostly what we do is delete stuff. Okay? Deleting uh, detail, deleting stuff is a, is a way that our brains handle complexity, the overwhelmingness of complexity. Uh, uh, so identifying. And then, okay, so now we've identified it, so what? Okay, identifying fails the so what test. So what can I do then? Well, reducing complexity. Let's assume we are already in this massive, ugly, horrible morass of stuff we call complexity. What can we do to reduce it? Okay, and then we start doing that, and that feels good. And we gradually bring in whatever the opposite of complexity is. And, and then what we want to do is, as we move forward, to stop making such a mess. So the third part is, how do we avoid creating complexity in the first place. So that's where I'm going to try and go. Okay. So first off, let's talk about identifying complexity. There are many definitions of complexity. Uh, what's interesting is when, as soon as you start looking into fields that specialize in studying things like complexity, they come up with technical jargon that sounds really similar and means very different things. And then the way it's like a club because then the guys from the other club use the same words in slightly different ways, and then they know they're not in the same club. Okay, it's just like a sort of password thing. So in systems thinking, you have what they call detail complexity and dynamic complexity. So detail complexity is lots and lots and lots of bits. Many, many, many bits, and you have to learn all the bits. With sufficient study, you can sometimes learn all the bits. Dynamic complexity is emergent behavior. So weather as a system is actually a pretty simple system. Right? Weather has temperature, humidity, air pressure. That's, that's most of weather. Okay? The problem is emergent behavior. The problem is weather fronts and different bubbles of air and temperatures and humidity banging into each other, which means it is impossible to predict weather particularly well. We were coming here to Chicago from London. We looked at four different websites for the Chicago one-week weather forecast, four completely different sets of answers, all four of which were wrong, it turns out. Because then this happened, which I quite like. It's sunny outside if you're watching at home. Um, and apparently it's going to be sunny all week, which is awesome. So, yeah, so that's, that's dynamic complexity. Dynamic complexity you kind of got to live with, right? Emergent behavior you kind of got to be able to react to or try to react to. This isn't that. What I'm looking at is detail complexity, is fine-grained stuff. In complexity theory, there's a whole space called Kenevin, which is a Welsh word, uh, um, you have uh, complex versus complicated. Okay, why? Doesn't that make it more complicated? <laughs> or possibly complex? I don't know. But you have these different, there's these things. And so then when the Kenevin guys and the systems thinking guys get together, they'll fight. But it's sibling rivalry because they're all trying to understand complexity. Anyway, that's not the definition of complexity I want to go with. The definition of complexity I want to go with comes from this man. This is James Lewis. He's, a, uh, he's actually a principal consultant these days with ThoughtWorks, which is all very fancy. Um, and it means, so the further you go, the more kind of principal you become as a consultant, you, you do less and less and charge more and more for it. It's a fantastic model. So he's now charging loads for doing almost nothing. He's that good, right? But he came up with my favorite complexity metric. And he said, so he, he has an interestingly large head, okay? So he said, I don't like to look at any code that doesn't fit in my head, that's bigger than my head. Okay? So his head, about that big. Okay? So here, here is some code on a screen. Um, this screen, is there anyone using Sublime Text, editor? A few hands. This is the original blog post for the guy who was writing Sublime Text. He's like, this is my world, I want to solve that. Okay, so now look, we've got one, two, three screens, Another two little half screens off to the side there. OK, let's apply the James fits in my head metric. Well, patently, that's too big to fit in his head. That, that will fit in his head. Okay. However, there's another axis here. Whoa, look at that. That's three. That's going to require more than three James heads to even be able to look at that screen of code. Okay. That is insanely more complex than we want to be looking at. And this, all right, there's two there as well. OK. It's not really physically. What, otherwise, what we're going to have to do, if, if James's head becomes our standard unit 
of, of, of complexity, what we're going to have to do is chop off James's head and put it in a safe in Paris, okay, in the SI Institute, and that's not going to, yeah, um, so it gets all a bit Damien Hurst at that point. So not that, but what he's saying is, is it's about, he can only reason about something if it fits in his head. And that made a lot of sense to me, and that got me into all the, well, into all the rat holes I'm going to try and tell you about now. He said, um, so I can only reason about something if it fits in my head. And I immediately went to the contrapositive of that, for any logicians, which is this. If something doesn't fit in your head, you cannot reason about it. It turns out most of the stuff that we deal with doesn't fit in our heads. Sizes of systems, uh, software, organizations, uh, products, domains, don't fit in our head. So we come up with ways to cope. Okay? So if it doesn't fit in our head, we can't reason about it, so what do we do instead? We do what we know. We fall back on habits. We fall back on routines. Okay, this, I'm going to warn you now, the screen's about to get complicated. I'm going to put up a diagram, but I've, I'm going to try and explain the diagram to you in about three minutes. So just assume, even if, you, if you've not seen anything like this thing you're about to see before, this is from an a, uh, area of research called systems thinking. And systems thinking, the idea behind systems thinking is you, is you have the world is made up of interrelated components. And the relationships between the components and the loops that those relationships form are far more interesting than the components themselves. Okay? So this is beyond cause and effect to systems of interaction. And systems thinking has a set of what are called archetypes, which is for the software guys, it's kind of like patterns. So they say archetypes are things that occur again and again. And there's an archetype that looks like this. It's called the shifting the burden archetype. Okay? The way shifting the burden works, let me just explain the, 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 the symbols here. This is a line joining these two things. Okay? So anything in a box is either some kind of measure, something I can measure, or uh, um, it's some kind of phenomenon. It's a thing. Okay? So, and then what we have is connections joining the things. Some of these, whenever they form a loop, they form one of three types of loop. They either form a balancing loop. I see it's done like little scales. They draw little scales. And so the idea there is that over time these things will balance out. Or they form a reinforcing loop. That's supposed to be a picture of a snowball rolling down a, a, a mountain, gathering snow and you know, avalanche and all that. Um, the third one that isn't on here is an oscillating loop. So sometimes it kind of it keeps swinging between two stable states. Like you're standing in the shower and you go, oh, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too hot. If the, if the amount of time it takes for the temperature to change is just wrong, you can be doing this for a while, okay, whilst having the most miserable shower. So, okay, quick example. Back injury. So the back injury, the source of the problem is the root cause. Uh, sorry, back up. Um, what is this diagram showing us? This diagram is showing us this. Shifting the burden says, for any, given, uh, for any given set of symptoms, for some presenting symptom, there is typically some kind of underlying cause to that and some kind of symptom to that, the presenting symptom. What we tend to do, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there we go, that's better. What we tend to do is uh, attack this loop here, because you see this loop here is immediate. Something happens here, immediate effect here. This bottom loop here is about attacking the cause, which looks like a similar loop. It goes around in a circle, except here is where the magic happens. There's a delay. Any, any system in which there is delay, we become reluctant to do, because there's uncertainty there, and we fear uncertainty. And so we tend to go for the easy, for the quick win. So the, 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 the most common example of, uh, of uh, shifting the burden is back injury. So back injury is my, under, is my underlying cause. I don't know I've got a back injury. What I know is I have back pain. And I go, oh, my back's sore. Oh. So I think, oh, what shall I do for a sore back? What do I do with a sore back? I'll take some painkillers. I'll take painkillers. There we go. Quick fix. Take painkillers. Yay. Woohoo. Balancing. Right. Back pain. Back under control. That's fantastic. What should I be doing? Well, what I should be doing is down here. Exercise, diet, lifestyle, physio, all of that stuff that's going to systemically, over time, alleviate my back injury, help me recover, and therefore remove the back pain. I don't do that, though. I do the quick win. I take the painkillers. The problem happens over here. Over here, we get an unexpected side effect. 
okay, an unintended consequence of the painkillers. In this case, what's the unintended consequence of the painkillers? I start quite liking painkillers. <laughs> Me and painkillers have a special thing going on. And then not just those painkillers, because they don't really do it anymore. <laughs> the other painkillers, right? And so you get this whole thing going on. But also, don't forget, we've still got the back injury. That hasn't gone anywhere. And so now, because I'm taking painkillers, my back injury gets worse and worse and worse until it's unrecoverable. Okay? And so what happens here now, this is a reinforcing loop again. So side effect, I've become addicted to painkillers. That's bad. Okay? That's bad. That means my back doesn't get any better. Okay, we're not here. This is not a medical conference. So, let's look at a different example. Let's look at the example where we have system complexity. Big, complex, ugly code base, and I get stuck in my code base, and I, just, oh, I can't reason about this code. It doesn't fit in my head, okay? But I'm not aware of big system complexity. That's too abstract of a thing. What I'm aware of is this. I'm aware of frustration. I'm aware of confusion. Uh, I find the code in which I feel the most helpless of you know, quite a wide breadth of enterprise-y type code that I get to look at is usually Rails apps. I have no idea what's going on in a Rails app. Okay? And if something goes wrong in the database, I have a 17 deep stack trace of stuff somewhere deep in there in some cryptic ways. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in there. There's magic. I also can't look at code and reason about it because some metaprogrammer, yeah, right, has injected a bunch of crap that I can't see and left no trace that they've injected a bunch of crap, so the code I'm looking at is not the code that runs. Thanks. Right? This happens to me a lot. I've never felt more helpless than in someone else's Rails app. Okay? That's just a personal thing. And I love Ruby. Ruby's a great language. Rails, ah, I don't understand it. Apparently, lots of people like it, so I'll leave it there. So frustration, confusion. I, don't, I, I can't reason about this code. I can't reason about what it does, where I should make the change I want to make, Impact analysis, how to figure out whether the change I'm going to make over here is going to cause a whack-a-mole problem over here. Okay, I don't have those things available to me. So what do I do? I go, la, 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 it's a really complicated code base. I work around it. I Typically, I see this massive nested, wavy, if nested thing going on, and I just squeeze my new condition in there a little bit. Yeah, I could tidy it up, but I'm kind of in a hurry, and it's only one little if condition. Oh, and it's there as well. Oh, and there, and oh, forgot one over there. Right, chip it. Yeah, cool. Shh, say nothing, right? So this is what we do. What should we be doing? We should be tackling the underlying complexity. That's really hard. It's usually really hard, usually fairly thankless, and also, don't forget this delay. We've got to ship stuff, and what am I saying to the people yelling for the stuff? Well, I'm just kind of taking care of business over here, and I'm doing some cleaning up, and I'm reducing the complexity, and they're going, for what? And I can't answer that. I don't know when the payoff is going to be. There's uncertainty there. I don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes. And also, I don't know what the payoff will be. If I could, put, if I could quantify either of those, I might be in with a shout, but I'm not, so I'm kind of going on instinct. I really, really think we should clear up something here, because otherwise the wheels are going to fall off. Shut up, Dan. Ship it. OK. We'll do that. So side effects here. Well, the desperately sad side effect here is that we lose key skills. We lose the ability to be frustrated with that code and to use that energy, direct that energy to simplifying things. Uh, things as simple as wrapping big bunches of stuff in some kind of interface, some kind of uh, barrier where I can say everything behind there is a bit weird, but basically what it does is price trades. No idea how, but I know if I put enough trade data and market data in, I get a number back, and I can make decisions off that number. And so now I can start reasoning about that. Things like looking for seams in big code bases, we lose the skills to do that, okay? because we never do it. So, okay, here's the bad news. Those painkillers are everywhere. I want to give you a few examples um, and hopefully get you feeling as uncomfortable as I feel um, about some of the stuff that we have. <coughs> um, and also, I'm hoping you're going to look at this and go, wait, but that's just a thing we do. Because that's why it's subtle, right? One of the challenges is, but that's the way we've always done it. I don't buy, but that's the way we've always done it. Uh, um, 
So, yeah, let's see. Here's a few examples. We're going to look at architecture. We're going to look at design. We're going to look at tooling, some techniques, programming techniques. We're going to look at process, organization. Just a few quick examples. Okay, I just want you to get a, a, a sense of, of where the painkillers are. So, enterprise mandates. We will use such and such a, a design stack. Uh, who's... Who, was, who lived through the joys of everything has to be Sun Blueprint J2EE? I want, I want JSPs talking to servlets, talking to session beans, talking to entity beans, talking to a DAO, talking to a database to change a field on a web page. That. So now I want to, uh, I want to change the name of the field, heaven forbid. Right. Oh, crikey. Or a thing that was an int now needs to become a float. Okay. So we play get, set, ping pong. Get that, set that, get that, set that, get that, set that, get that, set that, get that, set that. Insert. Doesn't work. Set that, get that. Get that, get that, get that. Oh, I don't know. Deploy. Boo. Okay. Enterprise mandates. I'm working with a company at the moment who recently decided that everything was going to be in Python. Everything. All new software is going to be in Python. Okay. There's a wonderful quote from a comedy show in the UK um, from the 80s. And there was, they were running an advert on TV for a, quite a long time. And it was trying to get people to move to a, a new town in the UK called Milton Keynes. And it said, wouldn't it be lovely if all cities were like Milton Keynes? And it would show you these idyllic shots of Milton Keynes, this town. Don't go to Milton Keynes. But anyway, it's this beautiful... And, and, and so the, the, the response to this comedy show was, it would be dreadful if all cities were like any city. <laughs> Wouldn't that be dreadful? Yeah? We don't want all cities to be like any city. And this is the same thing. Wouldn't it be dreadful if all systems were like any system? Right? Because surely that's not about fit for purpose. That's about some blanket mandate. And so we get a lot of this. We get a lot of this blanket enterprise mandates. And again, it's for our own good. It's because most of us are dumb. Right? We shouldn't be allowed out anyway. Certainly shouldn't be coding on our own. Pair programming is good because it's kind of like parenting. It's kind of, you know, you've got, you've got a buddy, right? Hands up if you haven't got a buddy. Okay, go pair with that person. So, enterprise mandates. So, what else then? Design. Undirected local choices. It took me a long time to come up with this phrase. I'm fine with local choices. I love people making, I love federated decision making. Okay. Does anybody know what federated means? I'll give you a def definition. Federated. It's... The decision is allowed to happen locally within a strictly defined decision-making framework. Okay? So you have local law is still made under a law-making framework. It's still executed under the same way as any other local law. There are guidelines. It's not, oh, go nuts. Okay, so we are Utah, and we're going to go with anarchy. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's not going to happen in Utah because everyone there is far too nice. Okay, we could go to Texas. Everyone there is going to, oh, it kind of already is, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, <coughs> so the point is this is undirected. And one of the things I think that's happened as a dreadful shame in the last 10 years, 15 years, with the, the kind of onslaught, the advent of all these agile methods, is we talk about... Um, uh, we talk about kind of empowering teams... And we say, we want you guys to be self-organizing. Okay? I'm fine with self-organizing. Now, there's another term, though, that sits alongside of self-organizing, which is self-directing. Self-directing says we will decide what we're going to do. Self-organizing says we will figure out how we're going to get there. So General Eisenhower, one of the sort of great 20th century generals, he, he used to get these insanely... Um, like, he used to get the kind of results from his men that no other generals would get. And they said, like, how do you do that? He said, it's really easy. I don't tell them what to do. I tell them what I need to happen, but I don't tell them what to do. He said, if you don't tell people what to do, you will be amazed at how ingenious and creative uh, they can be. So I don't tell them. I tell them the objective. Where we're doing this sort of agile hands-off stuff, particularly at scale in organizations, is we're saying... Oh, management is bad. Telling people what to do is bad. Ergo, none of that. Let's just see what happens. Okay? And what happens, it turns out, is a mess in most cases. So what we actually want to do is we want to have direction. We want to set direction without being directive. We want to say, this is where we're going without micromanaging the how. And then you'll be amazed, again, at how well people will do the how. 
That's awesome. Without giving them a why or what for, they'll just do stuff. And if you're lucky enough that that stuff coincides with anything you care about, well done. Okay? But it's pretty unlikely. So undirected local choices don't roll up. You get, you get chaos. Local choices, languages are a local choice. Okay? So in the UK, we have English, we have Welsh, we have Gaelic in, in Ireland. These are all local choices. They emerge locally, and locally they're fine. When people meet at the edges, they mostly fight. Okay? They certainly don't understand each other until they all speak English. Okay? English happened to win. So, uh, um, in fact, French and Latin won for a while, but English ended up winning. And there's no kind of gentle transition from Gaelic to English. You just learn English. There's no gentle transition from Welsh to English. They're different languages. So these local decisions made sense locally. They don't roll up. You will not get that rolling up. What else? IDEs. Ooh. Your IDE is a tool for masking complexity. Okay? So uh, I read a fantastic blog post, and the comments on it were wonderfully bily as well. Like, how dare you? You don't understand programming, you fool. And this guy said, basically, he said, your IDE is, is a, uh, a facade over how crap your language is. So let's look at something like Java. Okay? Java as a language, it's okay. I mean, I've been using Java for many, many years. I've kind of gotten you know, used to its warts and stuff. Here's the thing. Java, as a very early language decision, said we will couple class names to file names. They will be the, 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 the same thing. So if you change a class name in Java, give you, if I change a class name in Python, I do some typing. I'm done. If I change a class name in Java, say I've got a sheep.java and a, a class called sheep and I want to turn it into a class called cheese for some reason, then I don't just ch replace the word sheep with the word cheese. I create a new file called cheese.java, copy sheep.java mostly, except I'm replacing some of the words on the way through, delete the original file, uh, and then go and look for any references to it anywhere else in the code base and change those atomically. <laughs> the fun starts when I start changing package names, because a package name references a directory. So now I've got an arbitrarily deep nested file structure underneath some point, and what I'm going to do is create a sibling file structure next to it that replicates it all, copy all the files in mostly, because I'll change the package name, remember, and put all those in, and then delete recursively, depth first, all of the old files, and then go through every reference to those, to the package name, and change all that atomically. Right? If people had to use regular text editors to use Java, no one would be using Java. It's just too much of a pain, or at least no one would be refactoring in Java. Yeah? And what that might have caused is that might have caused enough back pressure early in Java's life that they rescinded such a ridiculous decision. But they didn't, because IDEs. Okay? And so, <coughs> again, these it's, it's a fantastic tool. Mostly what it's doing is masking the dumbness of some of the core language decisions. So most people I know who, who program in uh, Ruby or Python or JavaScript will mostly use Vim, Emacs, no, not Emacs, but like, you know, TextEdit or Sublime Text or, you know, they don't, you know, anyone, uh, Clojure people, you have to be smart enough to understand Clojure to be s masochistic enough to enjoy Emacs. I, I don't know, some relationship there. <laughs> Build automation. I used to be a huge, huge advocate of automating builds. Oh, no, what's he going to say about builds? Um, I need to speed up is what I'm going to say. So uh, build automation, it sounds like a sensible thing to do. Automate your build, make it repeatable. No. Your build becomes the rug under which you sweep every crappy infrastructure decision you make all the way through your product until you end up with, on, the, on one of the largest projects I worked on that 10 years ago now, there was a build... XML, sorry, there was a build script that would take a bunch of candidate XML files, put them through an XSLT, generate a bunch of build files, which would generate build files, which ended up being about two megs of build rules for a Java app. At the time, it made sense. Every single one of those tiny decisions made sense. Yeah? Oh, my word. So I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm saying they're painkillers as well as whatever else they might be. Okay? So revisit these things. TDD. I, I don't need to talk about TDD because apparently it's dead. Okay? 
not dead. It's not dead. The, the thing with TDD, I do a lot less TDD than I used to. I don't do none. I'm a huge fan of TDD. The thing is, TDD, I, I think of TDD as deliberate ignorance. I am going to, in order to reason about this piece of code, I am going to have to isolate it from all the other really ugly, messy bits of code because they don't make sense. Or rather, I can't fit them in my head. I can't fit the whole system in my head. Therefore, in order to test this thing, I need to reason about it in the small. And so I write these very small tests. It's fantastic for doing small-scaled uh, targeted design. It's a brilliant, brilliant design method within the construct of a larger strategy. Okay? There's a second half to that sentence. Right? So again, I'm not saying don't do TDD. I'm not saying don't automate your build. I'm saying be aware that as whatever else it's giving you, it's also acting as a, as a painkiller to the complexity around you. Um, process, too much process, too little process. Interestingly, if you look at something like Scrum back in the 90s when it was invented, it was exactly the right amount of process. It would take months and months and months to do anything. Scrum came along and they said, no, actually, it would take years to do something. Scrum came along and said, we can do this in months and, and prove the impossible. The same process 20 years later is now a little bit silly, right? It's now, we are going to get together every two weeks. Right? If you're listening to Adrian Cockcroft this morning, he can build, deploy, test, destroy, and abandon half a dozen products in two weeks. Why on earth would you want two weeks to be your planning schedule? That's just bonkers. Two hours, maybe. Two days at a stretch. Two weeks? Oh, sorry, I've, I've changed companies twice. Right? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? We've, we've pivoted. We've pivoted. That's no longer even the thing anymore. Um, and, and finally, I just want to mention Conway's law. So organization, when you have organizational complexity, we, we buffer ourselves by creating software complexity. If the upstream and downstream guys are unreliable or unresponsive or I can't trust them, then what I do is I, 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 I put that distrust into my code. And this is why s architecture at scale starts to carry the organization or the communication structures of the organization you're in, which is Conway's law, is because we're trying to get work done. And the way we get work done is we insulate ourselves. The way to really get work done is to go upstream and speak to those guys and engage them. Or to go downstream and speak to those guys and engage them. When we're developers, going upstream is about creating collaboration with stakeholders. Right? When you're going downstream, that's about creating collaboration with operations folks and DevOps and all that good stuff. So these, these are things. These are, these are things that we can do. We don't do that. We surround ourselves with interfaces. That'll show. So, OK. Uh, I have 12 minutes left, and I'm just onto the second section. So that's OK. So no, in terms of reducing complexity, then. Uh, <coughs> reducing complexity really, really isn't that hard. The hardest bit about reducing complexity is recognizing complexity. OK? Monitoring your own cognitive load. So cognitive research, cognitive uh, psychology, suggests that there's a thing called cognitive load. Cognitive load is how hard it is to reason about a thing. So monitoring a cognitive load means this. It means, is the thing I'm reasoning about, should it be this hard to reason about this thing? Ward Cunningham has a lovely uh, illustration. He says, he says, there are some problems I love wrestling with. I come out of that problem uh, smarter. I come out of that problem having developed you know, as, as a programmer or as a product builder or something, I come out, he said, connecting to a printer isn't one of those, <laughs> right? <coughs> connecting to a printer is, oh, crap, here we go again, got to connect to a printer. You're kidding. Three hours later, still trying to connect to a printer, right? Brilliant. Uh, um, you know, that's, so, so cognitive load. Connect to a printer, three hours really hard work for a very, very smart programmer. That's not, that's not, that doesn't match, okay? So if you start to spot uh, um, cognitive load, disproportionate cognitive load, that should be an indicator that there's probably something you can do. Okay? So, the next thing to try and develop is to see what's really there. So, Terry Pratchett uh, writes about these witches in this, when it's uh, this world books. And one of these witches, she has the gift of first sight. I said, Don't you mean second sight? He says, No, she sees what's really there. Oh, yeah. So seeing what's really there, this is, this is surprisingly difficult. So uh, Joe Walms, who a bunch of you folks know, uh, um, 
So he was, I was working with him, and we were writing lots of Java stuff, and it was quite webby. And so we were kind of using Java web stuff. And he said, that servlet thing, who uses that? We're like, oh, I forgot that was in there. It's just kind of part of the world, right? It's just, it, we've just always had that. We've always had in Java web, we've always had the servlet container. And the servlet container has life cycle, has filters, interceptors, tear up, tear down, blah, 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 a bunch of weight. So Joe went off and re-implemented, he wrote a HTTP server in Java, because there aren't enough of those. Right? <laughs> but it turns out his just does that. His is just an HTTP server. No anything else. It has, as a consumer, it has one interface. The one interface is called uh, uh, request handler. It has one method on it. Guess what the method is? Handle request. That's it. It's kind of easy to test, kind of easy to understand. Starts in about a millisecond. Okay? It's, it's not a bad stack. Yeah? Why on earth would someone sit there and write a new web server? Because he, he saw what's really there. He has the gift of seeing what's really there. Um, this is the big one. If you can create consistency, you can create shared idioms, shared principles, then you start getting a huge win off the back of that. The first thing is this, is we don't want everything to be identical. I don't want all of you guys to be doing the same thing. That's silly. But if we are working off the same set of shared principles, principles plus some context, you apply them, that determines your practices. In this context, based on these shared principles, I will do this thing. It makes sense to do this thing. And what it means is if someone else were to come along with the same guiding principles, they're likely to make the same decision which reduces cognitive load. I can look in a situation and I can say, ah, you've done this thing, you've made this decision. I can see why you did that, because it's kind of similar to what I would have done. Right? Um, difference is data. This is a meme I've been trying to get out there. As, as soon as you have a certain degree of consistency, I can now start seeing inconsistency as signal. If we have, say, a, we all decide within this particular architecture, this particular system, this particular whatever, that mostly when we're sending messages around, we'll probably do it over HTTP and we'll probably use JSON. It's an arbitrary decision. We could send it over a message bus and use AMQP. I don't care. Whatever decision we make, we all decide we're going to make it. Except that I see Matt's written something and it's using direct memory allocation between two processes talking some binary protocol. What does that tell me? That tells me one of two things or one of three things. It tells me Matt didn't get the memo, right? <laughs> or it tells me that's all that Matt knows, whether or not he got the memo. Or what it might tell me is Matt got the memo, thanks. This is a special case. This might be a low latency fast path case, and that's why he's done it. In any case, I look at that, and it, because it's not like the other kids, that signal, and I go, oh, there's something interesting over there. If instead every single messaging decision was local, completely undirected, and totally arbitrary, I, it would all be noise. Every single bit of messaging going anywhere would just be arbitrary. Okay? And so then I wouldn't know that Matt had made that decision for that reason. He just made that decision because he read something on Hacker News that morning you know, that was cool. Obviously, that wouldn't happen because it's Hacker News. But, OK, <clears throat> so, and, and I guess the biggest takeaway that I had for, um, for trying to create consistency is, is, the, is when I realized familiarity and simplicity are different things. You get used to crappiness. What's happening is the crappiness is bending your brain in such a way that it's now OK with the crappiness. You're kind of creaking into a shape like that, and you're going, oh. That's not so bad. Yeah, I could do that. OK. Right, you're, that's happening in your brain. And then someone comes along and says, how does that work? And you go, ah, oh, you've got to be this shape, and it'll all make sense. OK. And, and so we've become familiar with the thing, but that doesn't make the thing simple. And so one of the things I try and do is, whenever I can, I'll get some fresh eyes into a situation. And I'll say, what's the dumbest thing you see? Because if you say something like, you know, get someone new in the team, and they say, hi, is there anything here you'd like to change? They're all on their best behavior because they're new. They go, no, 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 it's all fine. You say, what's the dumbest thing you see? And they say, well, your build takes 10 minutes, which seems a bit dumb, given the speed you're trying to move at. And, you, and then suddenly you go, oh, he criticized the build. Oh, no. 
Right, let me tell you the story about the build. It's taken us six months to get the build down from da -da 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 to 10 minutes. I'll have you know. We've worked long and hard on... Still 10 minutes. Still 10 minutes. It's still beyond the Adrian Cockcroft shiny item threshold of like, you know, 10 seconds or whatever. I'm still not okay. And he's right, or she's right. They're right. They come and they say, that build it takes too long. Because I know the history of the build and I've got the baggage with that build, I'm fine with 10 minutes. I'm actually not fine with 10 minutes, but my brain's bent enough into shape to be okay with it. Okay? New person is like, no, that's a weird thing. That's not okay. So try and get that in. Quick tale of two cities. This is, it doesn't come up terribly well here. This is central London. Here we've got Bank to St. Paul's and through to Tottenham Court Road. Uh, this is Chicago. This road here, Americans love this. This is Cheapside, then it becomes Holborn, then it becomes High Holborn, and then it becomes Shaftesbury Avenue. See that? That's all one road. They love it when we do that. We keep changing the road numbers, the side of the road, the numbers are happening on, the name of the road, just because we fancy it, right? And <laughs> the reason that happened is London is really lots and lots and lots of little villages that blurred at the edges. Chicago, bit planned. This one here is, oh now can you, can I even see that? Which one is it? Randolph, I think it's Randolph. Randolph is dead straight and it goes along there and it goes along there and it goes on, it goes on there to about infinity. I think it ends up at like, you know, Japan or somewhere. Right? State Street. State Street goes North State and then South State and then carries on down until you get to, yeah, you get the idea. Incredibly long, straight, very simple, and, and they've even got the numbering, so you number it by, uh, by, by block and you can, you can figure out from the house number how far away it is. We don't do that. We put 28 next to 162 for giggles. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this will fox the Americans. Yeah. Now, of course, any, any, literary, any, any literary people among you will, will know that Tale of Two Cities was nothing to do with America. It was about uh, the two cities were London and Paris. Paris is a really interesting city. Um, this looks a bit of a mess, right? Until I tell you it's designed on a spiral. So that's the first. It's a arrondissement, which are like boroughs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way around to 20. Okay? Do it again. Whee! It's called... Lescalgo, the snail. Okay, so they designed their. So what happened was, uh, it's in the 19th century, they they realised they already had an existing city. They couldn't just raise it to the ground and grid it up. Okay, so what they did is they took the areas they had and they zoned them in a spiral, because this happens. I can be if I'm anywhere here, every single street corner has the arrondissement on it as well as the street name. I know I'm in the ninth. If I walk for a few hundred yards in any direction. It will no longer say 9, it will start saying 2, or 8, or 10, or 18. And as soon as that happens, I know exactly where I am, and which direction I'm traveling. How cool is that? You don't need a grid, they've hacked around that. So this is quite a nice, nice model. Anyway, moving on, avoiding complexity. And the last thing I wanted to get to. <coughs> avoiding complexity, I guess the first thing really is to be aware, to be comfortable with the fact that complexity is always the default state. What do I mean by that? I mean, there isn't a physics. So in our universe, we have physics. So if I look at activity here, and I look at activity here, it's governed by similar laws, okay? And then if I start seeing activity over here that's weird, like water climbing up the side of a glass, or electrons spinning in the wrong direction, I can be fairly sure that something local here is very, very unusual, okay? So, People's subjective behavior doesn't have physics. It doesn't have governing laws, or governing rules, which means that fairly arbitrary things are going to happen locally. Even sensible sounding things. Gaelic makes a lot of sense to Gaelic speakers. Welsh makes a lot of sense to Welsh speakers. The way that language evolved made a lot of sense. Okay? The, the, the Welsh probably have 28 words for sheep and probably 200 words for rain. Okay? The, the English probably have 50 words for fight, right? It's just kind of, you know, it's just, it just, it's contextual. So, so because there's just local decisions, if we want anything to roll up, um, we need to create the physics. We need to define the rules. We need to all agree what the rules are. And then we can make local decisions that will roll up. What else are we saying? It grows one day at a time. There's a lovely Fred Brooks quote from the Mythical Man Month, where he's looking at a project, and the project's now running a year late, 
and he's standing in front of the US Senate or something and he's saying, well, you know, Professor Brooks, how on earth, how does the project get to be a year late? And he's uh, one day at a time. Yeah, that's how a project gets to be a year late. Okay? Um, complexity grows one little decision at a time. That's it. Okay? Um, consistency at scale, that means, is a daily choice. Every single day there will be forces, the way work works, the way organizations work, there will be things that are trying to cause us to, um, to create inconsistency. Inconsistency is like entropy. It's, it's the, the, the thermodynamics of, of knowledge, if you like. Okay? It's going to get messy. Keeping it not messy is a daily choice. What else? So again, we need to agree idioms and guiding principles. Once we agree those idioms and guiding principles, then at least we have a chance. Yeah. Uh, right. What else are we going to say? So, and then we're going to strive for simplicity. We can strive for it. It can be a thing. We can choose tools and techniques that are, that are going to um, make it easier. Certain, certain tools, certain languages, certain tool chains have affordances that make it more likely that we'll have consistency. Certain ones don't. Uh, I, I was going to mention Scala and Clojure as, as a couple of examples. I think Scala is a, a great language. It's just very, very unopinionated. I could do anything in it. Clojure has parens. That's most of Clojure right there. Okay. So because it's so simple, they went, this, is, this has made programming too easy. We should learn Emacs. So that's, that's, that's how that went. So let me just quickly sum up before I get rushed off the stage. Um, complexity is the default condition. Okay. Absent any decisions we make, absent anything else, complexity will grow. Entropy will increase. Okay. Local decisions will get made, will appear to make sense locally, will not roll up, will clash at the edges. We always, we always have the choice to simplify. We only have the choice to simplify if we can recognize where the complexity is and if we can arm ourselves with techniques that are going to help us do that. And consistency is the key. Consistency is the mechanism by which we can make, we can reduce cognitive load, we can, or make cognitive load appropriate. Some problems are intrinsically hard. That's fine. They don't need to be any harder than they are. It really shouldn't be this difficult. Thanks. Do I have time for any questions? Yeah, yeah a couple minutes for questions. Anyone want to ask a question? We have an infinite amount of time for questions at this pace. There we, we go. No questions sure. whatsoever. Oh, there's a question in front. Uh, so when you're aiming for consistency, if you come into a particular situation that you could do one of two ways, maybe it's a coding style, something like mm -hmm. that, and you don't know which is better, yep. when do you choose one and set a standard? That's a really good question. So, right, so we, we've got a choice to make, OK? Um, and there's the, the lovely um, Yogi Berra quote, says, when, when, you, when you come to a crossroads, take it. Okay? <laughs> when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, the problem with that is that that's, that's rooted in the physical world. So when I come across a situation where, you know, okay, we're on the JVM, we've been using Java for a while, we could go with Scala, we could go with Clojure, we could stick with Java, we could look at some other JVM languages, what should we do? My answer is always yes. Right? Yes, we could do any of those four things. Let's try those four things. Let's try those four things in parallel. Let's try those four things in parallel on a real example of real stuff. Okay, it's called set-based engineering. So the idea is we're going to do all of the things, and at some point, data will emerge. At some point, it will become obvious that one of these is a better fit for the kind of things we're doing than the others, and I suspect it won't be the one we thought of. So I, I, had, I, I had a real example of this about a year ago. I was doing my class, I run a class called Accelerated Agile, and I was doing this class. And two successive classes, I had the same question. We're on JVM, we're using Java, Clojure or Scala? Dan, what do you think, Clojure or Scala? And I said, yes. I said, yes, Clojure or Scala, or maybe Java, right? So the teams, in both cases, went off. There were about six people in, in the team, so they had a, different pairs, spent a couple of weeks, one, one pair doing Scala, one doing Clojure, one doing Java, for a couple of weeks. And then they all swapped around one. So by the end of four weeks, they all had experience of two of the, of the candidate languages in the same problem space. And after that, they said, well, what do we think as a team? And they all went that one. Now, the great thing about set-based engineering, it's inefficient, but it's very effective. So it, it costs three times as much to build this thing three times. But whatever decision you make, you already started doing it four weeks ago. 
Yeah? So you haven't lost any time, you've just lost a bit of bandwidth. Yeah? And so, so this is how Boeing designs uh, wings, for instance. And nowadays, I think it's law, actually, for a lot of safety-critical systems. Like if you're building um, braking software in cars, uh, uh, anti-lock braking, you will get three different companies to, to build this same, so same code, same system, um, you pay all of them. It's not like a cost of sale thing. You pay all of them, and then you use each two as the test bed for the third one, and then you end up going with whichever one you like. And so, again, that means it costs three times as much, but you end up with a system that you are now absolutely confident um, is reasonably stable, and you had a choice of three to, to choose from. So Boeing does it with wings, cars, car systems do it with safety critical, fly-by-wire systems, all that kind of stuff. And then you throw the other two away, so you're not left with inconsistency. Yeah, exactly. Or what you may do is you may say, we're going to go with this one. We're going to go with Scala, but we noticed a really nice bunch of programming paradigms that we picked up in Clojure that's going to inform our programming style in Scala. We quite like that it's a gentle path from Java. We are also, we're not happy with the fact there's 15 different ways to do looping. So we're going to use recursion, because we quite like recursion. Or we're going to use map and reduce. We're not going to use iterators and for loops. You go, okay, well, that's, a, that's an idiom. That's a design choice we've made based on our experience in some other languages. And so it's not, just, it's not binary one, two, three. It's not a single choice. It could be we're going to take this, but we're going to inform it with these other things. So. I'm standing between people and lunch. That's always a bad place to be. <laughs> we'll do uh, one more question and then lunch. And I'm around for the, the whole thing, so... Okay. I have a question when you're, sort of, when you're uh, trying to reduce complexity, when you're designing something or architecting things, and generally designing for the general case, but then mm -hmm. you get situations where things are too general and don't really solve any problem well versus over-architecting something, and something is very specific, but it's very fragile. How do you sort of keep things simple but avoid yeah. one or the other? So there's a chap called Chris Matz who talks a lot about real options, and he has a lovely... So he, he, he looks at the phrase Yagni, and he says, you, know, you ain't going to need it. So, so, so the point of real options, or, or thinking in options, is that you should, uh, you should make decisions deliberately. In other words, you should defer a decision okay, for as long as it makes sense to defer it. You shouldn't commit early unless you've got a good reason. Okay? If you've got a good reason, commit early, for sure. If you don't have a good reason, don't commit early unless you know why. So Yagni is only the first half of that sentence. It just says, don't commit early. Right? It says, oh, you're not going to need it. Okay? So don't commit early unless you know why. It is you might going to need it. Yeah. So for instance, if I'm building something and I know fairly soon there's going to be not just a single case but two, okay? there's going to be more than one, then there's nothing wrong with me designing for the more than one case now. I'm not going to make an uber generic thing. I'm going to be aware that this thing is going to need to support, is likely to need to support uh, more than one cases fairly soon. So I don't need to code them all in now. What I'm probably going to do while I'm thinking about it is leave the seams there. Make it obvious when someone comes back, and the obviousness thing is really important. Make it obvious when someone comes back where they need to make that change. Oh, look, he left the hook in here that I could do this thing. It's a very small hook. If no one ever needs it, it's not going to get in the way but it just makes it easier. I'm sort of thinking ahead because the person who I might be handing this off to might be me. Right? <laughs> so it's slightly selfish. But the, um, there's also uh, something I, I've been talking about for a long time um, is this idea of a change event horizon. So a change event horizon is how long after I make a dumb decision, how soon after making a dumb decision can I recant that dumb decision? Can I reverse that decision? When I'm writing, in my world, I write business software, I write enterprise software, typically my change event horizon is about a week. Right? In an emergency, it can be hours. I just stuff this thing up. Within hours, I will have unstuffed it. If you're designing an API, a programming language, a hugely used library, something like that, right? your change event horizon, if you put something dumb into C Sharp, your change event horizon might be 30 years. Yeah. I mean, literally, there are some dumb decisions in Java that are still there. Okay? People are still using new Java util vector. Okay? Vector was deprecated in Java 1.1. That's before a lot of you were born. Right? <laughs> but, so uh, people still use Java util vector. And so they went, OK, look, we can't get rid of vector. What we'll do is we'll, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll get, we'll, we'll get underneath vector and we'll actually make it a list. 
People, they need never know, right? Phew, there I fixed it, bit of gaffer tape under it. Yeah, so if you have a long change event horizon, then it means that you need to be much more careful about the decisions you make. So it's, it's, again, it's a deliberateness thing. Just be aware of the context you're in and let that inform how far out you make those decisions. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Dan North. Cool, thank you.